Greetings all, Ferrariman601 here. You're probably wondering why you're seeing a musical score in front of you. Well, currently I am in the midst of working on the Porsche 911 video that many of you have already seen, and at the beginning of that video you will have noticed this resplendent arrangement of the German National Anthem. Any time that any sort of music is featured in my videos, I have either written it myself or I have arranged it myself. I write my own music as a hobby. I'm trying to teach myself classical theory and composition, and, uh, well, I've been doing that for about six or seven years now with some limited success. And the reason why I use my own music or my own arrangements in my videos is because of copyright. Yes, YouTube has some rather draconian policies when it comes to copyright restrictions. You can use a piece of music that itself is hundreds of years old. For instance, this piece actually written by Joseph Haydn, who died in 1809. So he's been dead for over 200 years, so he has no copyright personally on any of his works. But recordings are copyright by the performers and the orchestras that com that compose them and produce them. So I can't use them without paying royalties, and I don't want to do that because Ferrari Man is a cheap guy. Regardless, this is what I do to make the music that you'll hear in some of my videos. I sometimes use it in uh, the uh, beginning sequences of the bigger review pieces, like the Porsche piece, so, you know. It's just a little stylistic thing that I've chosen to do. I like music. Why not incorporate that into Ferrari Man 601? Anyway, I'm in the midst of working on this arrangement of the German national anthem. Any Germans in the audience? I mean to be as respectful as possible. One of the things that you do have to consider when you are arranging a national anthem is you've got to be respectful of it. You have to maintain its integrity as a melody, first and foremost, and secondly, you can't really do too many variations on it because you might run into some political backlash, so try to keep it as cohesive as, and cogent as possible with respect to the original as it's commonly performed. In addition to that, this is a piece by Joseph Haydn, and Joseph Haydn is a god in my mind. You can't study music without being familiar with the works of Joseph Haydn, and his his life and his influence on the history of music was so substantial that the entire classical era, the timeline of the classical era in music appreciation, you'll define it from around 1750 to about 1810, and it just so happens that that is roughly the lifespan of Joseph Haydn, the man. 1732, I believe he was born, he died in 1809. So he has an entire historical era dedicated to him. So I'm arranging a national anthem, number one, and I'm arranging a piece by Haydn. So we're really delving into the realm of scariness here when an amateur composer such as me is trying very, very basically, in a very rudimentary sense, to do something with such an austere work, with such an austere provenance. This melody itself, it comes from one of Haydn's emperor quartets, string quartets that he wrote for the emperor of the Austrian Empire at the time. Haydn was um, the court composer of the Esterhazy family in uh, what is now Hungary. At the time, Austria-Hungary, the Austrian Empire, Austria and Hungary were united in that hegemonic rule over Central Europe, and Haydn was their court composer. He wrote a whole bunch of arias, cantatas, masses, and of course, symphonies, 104 symphonies in his output. But Joseph Haydn, basically the man who invented the symphony as we came to know it, and then of course everybody else played with the form as well, both his contemporaries such as Mozart and Beethoven, and then of course uh, much later into the modern day. People are still writing symphonies today. You can thank Joseph Haydn for it. Anyway, that explains all the craziness behind this. Here's what I've come up with so far. The technicalities of this. This is a piece in 4-4 four, four time, it's common time, four beats per measure. You get four quarter notes in a measure, that's how you define the rhythm and the meter of this piece. I've chosen to arrange it in G major. When you hear the German National Anthem performed uh, today, they choose any number of, of key signatures for it. It's quite common to hear it in G. It's also common to hear it in C. Uh, it's, it's easier to perform on, on many instruments in the key of C, uh, particularly on the piano, because the, the key of C 
major has no sharps or flats. Uh, G major, however, it's got it's got one sharp in it, but uh, it's it's still a very easy key to perform in. It's also a pretty easy key to write for. You don't have to worry about semitones and things like that. So we're in G major. We're in four four time, and I'm working up this arrangement for full orchestra. So I have got first and second violins. I've got trumpets. I've got horns in F. I have flutes oboes, and then I also have uh, a bass line, technically I guess you could call it a double bass line with string bass and then uh, an organ bass, just uh, playing the bass line there, backing everything and, and uh, giving a solid foundation to all of this. So here's what I've come up with so far. I have not yet set the entire melody. I'm trying to work out harmonies, and I'm also trying to work out uh, some variations in the second violins as well as uh, a fugato type entrance in the organ in the uh, in the uh, repeat of the main theme here so here's what i've got so far have a listen <laughs> So obviously you can tell it rather abruptly cuts off there right before the uh, the principal motive uh, will enter again to end the piece. Uh, if you're familiar with this piece, you'll also notice that I have omitted the coda at uh, bar 16 there. You can see uh, where we come in right in this section here. You just see the first violins, they're carrying the melody. I just have the horns uh, sort of in a contratino role, if you want to call it that. They're really just outlining uh, the, the outline of that G major chord um, in its uh, inversion there. But um, just the violins carrying the melody and the, the coda at the end uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the anthem, as is performed now, there's a little coda at the end. It repeats the last uh, couple of lines of the text. Here, I've omitted that because I'm just going into a repeat of the principal theme and beginning the the second iteration of this, and uh, we'll end uh, back with that theme. The uh, the principal theme, obviously, um, at the end, probably running in the bass line while we play. The melodic line here starting at bar 25 uh, that the flutes currently have. You'll notice that for the principal motive I've uh, given the melody to the violins, just the first violins in the first uh, iteration of it. Accents with uh, timpani, the big kettle drums and, uh, and trumpet as well with the timpani. Um, I give the flutes the melodic line for the second motive in the piece, and it's actually it's a very simple piece. Um, there are only three principal motives in it, and uh, they're they're each very nicely organized into four-bar phrases. I, that's one of the reasons why I love classical music because you have very even and precise and organized phrasing to everything. You very typically you're going to see a four-bar phrase um, in a four-four time signature or a two-four time signature. Also in a two-four you'll see um, two-bar phrases. In a in a three-four time you'll see sometimes three-bar phrases, but still pretty common to see four-bar phrases in in three-four as well. When you start to get into compound meters like six-eight or twelve-eight things like that, then you start to have a little bit more leeway in terms of your phrasing. But very nice four-bar phrases, and there are only three of them throughout this entire song, one uh, of which is repeated in the beginning. So 
It's a very tidy, simple piece, but in its simplicity, it gains its its performability. It's very easy to sing. It's also very easy to learn because it only has three principal parts. You can learn it after hearing it one time. And if you're picking something that uh, you're going to use as your national anthem, you want something that's easy to sing and easy to remember. And that's what this is. Very nice choice uh, on the hand of Germany for picking this as their national anthem. But you can see, uh, particularly in the end, where things start to get a little bit sketchy again, uh, we come into the uh, the reprise of the principal motive here at the beginning, where I have everything fully drafted for the first and second violins. The second violins come in just play, basically playing the bass line transposed up into the upper octave, and then they start to get into their little accompanying counter melody, if you want. It's not quite a, a counter melody because it's not really playing with counterpoint here, but at the same time, it's uh. It's again, it's a variation on the theme, just messing about with the outline of the G major chord. Um, I start to play a little bit with, with syncopation a little bit. For example, in bar 19, two eighth notes, a quarter, another two eighth notes, another quarter there on the fourth beat. And then everything sort of cohesively comes together for the end of the phrase with the bass still sort of puttering along here. That's a little bit sketchy. Um, that may change a little bit by the end, but uh, just trying to get you into the, the mindset of what's flying through my head right now thinking about this. Timpani, they get a trill here, a drum roll if you will, uh, on the dominant before we go back down to the, to the uh, tonic G, with this is bass clef here, um, for the, the second uh, repeat of that principal motive. The uh, violins in bar 22, they go into a, a little bit of a a cheerful counter melody, if you will. I don't like to repeat things literally. Even though this is a, a short piece and it does require you to repeat motives basically sequentially, um, I, I like to throw a little bit of variation in there. It keeps the, uh, the listener engaged and honestly it keeps me engaged as well. So that's why I've gone for that little counter melody there. And again, everything ties itself back together here by bar 24. The phrase begins in bar 21 and it ends in bar 24. Everything has to come back together on that half note there, making a nice uh, chord there to bring in this uh, phrase with the flutes. Once again, when they take the melodic line, just a little bit of accompaniment figures in the violins. The first violins here have, have yet to write anything in the seconds. I'm not sure if I ever will. Um, I may just have them double the first violins. They may play in unison. We'll see. The bass here, just for these two bars, 25 and 26, very sketchy. But in bar 27, and then leading into uh, bar 29, where we'll have the re-entrance of the principal theme, I have this fugato-type entrance in the organ bass. Um, I'm not sure if I'll also uh, double that in the strings, but this is actually the main theme, the first motive of the piece that's being reiterated here as a bass line accompanying the flutes as they are going down here in measure 27. So a little bit of, 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 of opposing motion here, going up in the bass and down in the treble, so I like that as well. And uh, rhythmically, in terms of timing, it's, it's almost an exact mirror image rhythmically of the treble line, the bass line here. So Haydn, even though this was a small piece, he had a lot of insight into, of course, he wrote this late in his career as well, but he, 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 was, he was thinking all the time about how do I keep things interesting? How do I have uh, metrical rhythmic variations on material that I've already presented? And how does it all balance each other? In, in the classical aesthetic, there is this big emphasis on coordination and, and, and symmetry and balance. And they all work together quite nicely to, to create some, some wonderful moments in, in classical music. I think pretty much nobody was better at that than Mozart. Of course, Haydn and Mozart were contemporaries of each other, and, uh, and they knew each other. Um, Joseph Haydn's brother, Michael, actually was a personal friend of uh, Wolfgang Mozart, and they, they shared a lot of material, actually. But um, that, that aesthetic of, of coordination, balance, and symmetry very important in classical music, and even here you can see Haydn absolutely taking that into consideration just in a short piece like this. It's really, really cool. Um, just that last section again uh, from bar 21 we'll play from as we're uh, ending that. Uh, yeah, we're coming into the principal motive again, and then we go into the, the variation, if you like, the second theme. And, you'll, and listen for the, the counter motion in, in, uh, in bar 27.
So you see what I mean? The organ there coming in with the bass line, playing the principal motive of the entire piece as we're in the second motive of the piece. It's, it's cool. That's called a fugado when you have two or more themes that are that are sort of interplaying with each other. Of course, it derives from its bigger brother, the fugue, which is when you have, uh, it's a highly contrapuntal piece where you have at least two principal themes, usually more. A fugue is usually written in three to four, or sometimes even more voices. And um, each one of those voices will have its own, its own subject, they call it, its own principal theme. And they'll be reiterated sometimes hundreds of times throughout a single piece, all playing with each other uh, in, terms of, in terms of harmony. So in terms of their tonality, playing with tonics, dominance, submedians, things like that, as well as with timing, the rhythm and, and the, uh, the, the overall pulse of the music. You'll have entrances that are staggered by, by whole measures or by beats or by fractions of beats, things like that. And uh, just trying to get a little bit technical here. Of course, I can't even begin to hold a candle to what uh, other people can do. And certainly nowhere even close to being on the same planet as somebody like Joseph Haydn, because he wrote many, many fugues throughout his career and as parts of many pieces, particularly in his uh, liturgical works. So just again trying to play a little bit with what i know about the the classical style as well in here so as you can see even though this is not a piece that i have written just trying to arrange it and trying to apply what little i actually do understand about how music works um, you can see that things actually can get pretty technical so when you hear that intro music in some of my review videos, just know that quite a bit of work actually went into it, even if it is a piece that I didn't come up with by myself. Okay, so here we are in the program that I actually use to write. The other program has much better uh, sound samples in the MIDI sequencer there, so uh, that's where I'll, I'll listen to it and, and decide when and where things need to be tweaked. But uh, I write in here just because the screen is bigger and uh, it's, it's a little bit easier to navigate. The other program is called Notion 6, in case any of you are wondering. This is called Notation Composer 3. This is, a, this is an older program and it's a little bit more rudimentary, but at the same time I find it to be a little bit more accessible just in the way that uh, it displays everything. It doesn't necessarily display everything correctly, but it does display things in, in an accessible manner, so you can figure it out. We're at the, the end of where we just left off here. You can see the flutes tootling along, taking the melody there, and the uh, violins playing these accompanying figures down here. Building up here, uh, first in eighth and then in sixteenth notes, uh, bringing up toward their entrance with the, uh, the ending theme. So here is where we, uh, we've got to pick up with all of this, right here. <laughs> And right there at the end, this is this is where the tension in the music is building. Uh, obviously, it's going to have an immediate resolution because we get into the ending theme, um, the ending motive rather, and. We, everything comes to a nice and uh, almost almost supple sort of ending here. Uh, we're going to have a repeat at the end, so that means I've only really got to write this once, which is nice. So we need... what do I want to do here? I, I want the violins to take the ending in terms of taking the melody because that's symmetrical. Making sure that we're respecting the conventions of uh, of the style so we need a dotted quarter all the way up here that's really high that is very near the edge of the uh, the register for uh, the violins but that's what we've got to do dotted quarter and then an eighth note just coming down that's not the right place and All right. Going back through the score, trying to see uh, what it is that we have done. If there were any little metrical surprises that we had to put in there uh, at the end. Again, trying to keep things symmetrical. 
Yep, that's what we want to do. So, dotted quarter, eighth, eighth, eighth quarter. That's what we've done. Did we? Yep. Eighth, eighth quarter. Yep. Yep, just trying to get my bearings here. I've stepped away from this for a couple of hours trying to figure out what's going on. There we go, I selected the wrong one. Quarter. Boom. And then the same rhythm. Here's where we get to the end. Dotted quarter, sixteenths to fill the eighth. And then eighths coming down. And tonic. That's what we gotta do. Now here is a, um, a difference in the rendering of everything. I did, I rendered this measure this way, highlighted here so you can see it better here. This measure that's highlighted, I rendered it this way with the eighth note and then the sixteenth rest before the sixteenth note because in the other program it's going to notate that in a more conventional manner but it's going to maintain the accent on that G and that's what I want. So we're going to have to do the same here. So it's going to be an eighth note and then a 16th rest, and then a 16th note, up a third. So we gotta, here's a workaround in this program that you've got to play with here. Put in three 16th notes, and then delete them so that it'll place the rest in the right place. It's a weird way to do it. Like I said, this program doesn't display things very intuitively initially, but once you learn how it works, you, you understand how to manipulate it. All right. So there's the G, up a third. And then another sixteenth rest. Place two sixteenth notes, delete one. And then uh, for the end, Let's do a half. So we end up with... There's where we want to be. And we go back down exactly to where we need to be at the end. All right, so that's the melodic line sorted. Now, of course, if you just listen to it like that, it sounds pretty rubbish. That's what it needs to do, and that's what it is doing. However, we need some accompaniment. We need some harmonies. We need some we need some structural weight to support that, because those violins being up so high that yeah, they're all very dainty and whatever. But we don't want this to be dainty. We want this to be the ending of a national anthem of a very proud and very powerful European country. Okay, so we can't just leave that by itself because it kind of sounds pretty pretty limp. So. This goes back to what we did in the beginning. This is the opening leaf of this, and you can see that I have some of the uh, accompaniment figured out. I don't know if I'm going to add anything more here, because I, I don't want to give away all of the surprises right at the beginning. So I've got, I have got the violins, the first violins are the only ones notated playing the melody here. I've got the, the, uh, the string basses, the, the double basses there in, in the bass line, and then the second bass line is empty uh, until we get into actually the, the second theme. However, 
I do have uh, the horns, trumpets, and timpani notated, at least uh, completely here in the first bar. It gives us this grand opening. So that's what we get in the first bar, and then I just have the horns uh, accompanying down through uh, measures two through four. However, we have to look to this for inspiration in terms of what to do uh, in this moment. Yes, it's very different, but again, balance and and uh, and uh, symmetry and design is what you've got to be thinking about when you do this. So that's what we did at the very beginning. At this same place in the piece, in the first iteration, you can see that we had the horns playing this uh, counter melody here. Here we go. And I left things pretty bare there. And I did that on purpose because immediately thereafter, on the next beat, we start to get into the, we've got the trumpets going, we've got the first and second violins, we've got the bass, and then we've got the organ down there just playing a scaffolded G major chord with uh, a couple of very uh, slight variations. So that was intentional, trying to maintain the uh, suspense a little bit for this moment. <laughs> So obviously you can see uh, why I chose to keep the, the, uh, the, the harmonies pretty bare in this section here. However, we can't afford to do that again because number one, we've already done it. And number two, we're at the end of the piece. So we can't do that. It's just not appropriate for this moment. So we need to figure this out. This is a more full section here. I've, I've, I've notated more of the instruments, and I want to have every instrument that has already made an entrance, I want that instrument to be playing at the end. So that means we basically need to sketch out a big G major chord at the end in all of the voices. And it takes a little bit of guesswork sometimes because you got to figure out where you want to put things, what instrument you want to be sounding when and what note it wants to be playing. So we've got to figure this out. We do need to have the bass line going. And uh, in case you've uh, you've forgotten, the bass line is playing that, um, that fugato type entrance. So just the flutes and the organ playing here at the end. Here we go this section. All right, so you notice there's a little bit of dissonance there in the bass line. That's intentional because we're coming up to the uh, the moment where the tension reaches its peak. So a little bit of dissonance, that's okay. Also, I'm just trying to really force that fugato in there, so it's not going anywhere. Sorry, guys. But um, back to this violin line. We need a bass line. I want second violins accompanying. I want the uh, the cellos down here playing their bass line, and I want the organ um, just playing a normal bass line. I'm not going to continue that fugato, I don't think. Uh, let's see. What could we do? How about... Let's play with the second violins, eighth notes. Let's try. There we go. See, I've set myself up for some uh, counter motion here. The uh, melodic line is going down and the accompany line is going up. We'll see how all that sounds in a moment. Sometimes you get clashes when you do this, uh, just trying to do it sight unseen. So we'll see how that works. Uh, and then for the ending, we need that syncopation again. We're on the dominant of D, and that's exactly where we need to be. A 
to maintain that. And we'll go down to the tonic of G. So an octave, the interval of an octave there in the violins. What does that sound like? Let's figure it out. we got to get all of our voices running again. Two sections I don't like. Here we have an obvious clash. I knew that was going to happen. I just wanted to see if I could get lucky. And I'm, uh, let's see. I'm not happy about. I'm not really happy about these two bars. Of course. <laughs> let's see. Where exactly does it go wrong? easily fixed. Uh, here we have, we're playing the same notes. Here, here, and here as well. It's just an octave. And it's a little annoying because it, it takes away the harmonic depth because there, there really is no a harmony there. It's a perfect octave, so there's there's no uh, harmony there to hear really. Technically, it is, but it's not really. Now, obviously, I went up because the natural trajectory of a of a melody like this. And I set myself up for an ascent and a descent, but we don't have to do that. Rather than doing that. Can we do that? That also works. It's a little bit of a weird. Yeah, you see. It's a minor interval there. Well, we'll see. It, it might work. Not even close. change the whole contour of the thing. Why not? Okay. Coming down to the C here. Sets me up for a little bit of a chromatic passage in this bar. Okay, fine. You gotta be willing to change stuff as you're going along. Do we iterate the scale literally? One option. How does that sound? Probably not good. And again, I lose that. I can turn it into parallel motion. So it's up for a fifth. Ah, that might work. We'll see. Also running into ending in unison there with this with the same rhythm. Uh, that's not a bad thing to end that way, but 
I could do something here with the timing to sort of preview the ending a bar early. Because the other thing that classical music does is often through through different rhythmic figures, it will announce to you when something's about to change. And it also it, it takes away a little bit of the of the of the shock value because and it's one thing that I hate about art today. People think that in, in order for something to be art, it has to be shocking. It has to just grab at you and, and be disturbing or frightening or whatever. No, 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 no. Listen to classical music. There are hundreds of little hints throughout a piece of what's about to happen next. Even if you haven't heard it before, you know something is about to happen because the composer tells you very politely. They need to, we need to bring that back in art, and that's what I want to do here. So, rather than just iterate this in eighth notes, so like this, I could play with the timing a bit and do a little bit of something. Let's do this instead. All right, here's my madness. Always going back down to the tonic because we're playing with the tonic. All right. There we go. The A sharp. No, the C, um, the C sharp rather. Another sixteenth rest. Oh, need a sixteenth. All right. You see what I've done there? Just by changing the timing a little bit, things are uh, things are a little bit less jolting when we get to the end, however you describe that. Let's see. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Do I think it's the best solution? No, but I think it's the solution that I've arrived at. Uh, the only other question I have here is how is that timing-wise with... Uh, Yep, it works. It's symmetrical, and I like it. We'll hit save while we can. Alright, so there's the first and second violins done at the ending. In context. Right, it, it works. It, it does work. Uh, I don't like that jump. Particularly that jump. They're not sequential notes, but... Because the second violins get to their top note in the last bar, I don't know if I want to be playing in that vicinity two bars ahead of time. You know what I mean? It kind of takes away... It takes away a little bit from the impact of the ending. Let's see. So rather than this... Uh-huh. What if we were... We need eighth notes, not 
sixteenths. All right. All right. Eh, kind of get a little bit of a circular motion going on here. Let's see. A little better, in context. It can work. It can absolutely work, and I think I'm satisfied with it. All right. So there are the two really technical parts of this. The melody's got to be intact, and you do have to have something convincing in, in its general vicinity to accompany. Now we can start to fill out the bass line. And typically when you compose, particularly if you're going to be in the classical style, you want to have a bass line set up first. However, because I know where this piece has to go, I can omit that until later on. Uh, the bass line here, just with the violins and uh, the organ, what is that? <laughs> quarter notes on the tonic Sort of pulling in the minor direction here uh, with the E, but that eh, might be all right. Let's say we'll throw a chord in here. All right. Just on the octave. How does that sound? Yes, that's okay. There's a little bit of dissonance here. Uh, we'll see what we can do about that. Right? These three beats. See, it plays a nice third, like that, but... And then this harmonic progression, you'll see this everywhere even today in pop music especially today in pop music um if if you listen to 80s pop music you'll hear this if you listen to pop rock today whatever you want to call it you'll hear this just listen to this progression here right here is the tonic playing around the the tonic the dominant and then the tonic again so just listen to this just like that that is how every artist throughout the history of tonal music has centered the listener around the tonic note. That's how they do it. It's a chord progression that you will see everywhere. Next time you listen to a pop song, listen for a progression, a cadence like that. You will hear it, and that's exactly what we're going to be using here. I just don't like the, the slight pulling toward the minor direction. <laughs> And you'll notice here in the last measure, just the eighth notes here, this actually, this is my brain unconsciously remembering, wait for it, 
this. You see what we did up in the horns at the first ending of this? And listen to what I did. Alright. Alright, just listen to the horns here. I can't get it queued up to play right. Alright, listen, listen for the chord progression in the horns. It's that right there. Yeah, so you've got that going on. So that's what the horns have done there. And now in the very end, listen to what the organ's doing. It's the same. Now, obviously, this is due to the, just, just the, the, the science and the math of all of this and what sounds pleasing to the ear and how intervals work and all of that. But at the same time, this is symmetrical to that. And it's the same sort of role as well. It's not the melody. It's an accompaniment. And that is exactly the sort of architecture that you've got to be thinking about when you're dealing with music of this vintage. So that's that. And let's see. Now that we've got the bass line sorted, what do we want to do with the cellos and the, the secondary bass line? What we've got going on with the cellos here is... Uh, what? Not a whole lot. Alright, first ending, I don't care about that right now. got to do is figure out what we're doing with the cellos so they're just playing uh g's here and then they go back up and down all right uh let's see and meanwhile the flutes all right We want to do this. Now you might think we could do something like this. Yeah, that's that's the Lady Gaga bass line. That's poker face. Anyway. And we can get away with that. I was thinking it might clash a little bit with the organs line, but it doesn't really. Let's uh, let's just double check that. here because that's going to sound terrible. Let's hear it anyway. Sounds weird because that's the interval you've got where no longer uh, within the tonality of G, uh, with that uh, with that almost unearthly sort of jump, and uh, it, it's quite jarring. I don't really like it. Oh, 
that's better. In context, the whole thing. <laughs> Let's do the Vivaldi motif. All right, uh, I, this little here, I call that the uh, the Vivaldi motif, only because if you listen to the beginning of his uh, of his Gloria uh, RV588, I believe it is, um, that's what the strings do. Bum 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 bum. That's what they do. So it, it, I, I like it, but. <laughs> progression. That should work now. Yes, it does! Okay, once again, respecting the rules of the masters, and they once again come through. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, the flutes are all by themselves. A lot of empty space up here. 
that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, right here, when the violins come in with the ending, what do we want to do? More flute action, more oboe action. Actually, speaking of oboe action, do we want some oboe action here accompanying the flutes like they did the first time around? Probably. Uh, shall we do this? Uh... Some overlap here, but maybe it'll work. Let's see. There's going to be some clashing. May not be bad, though. Let's see. Maybe not bad at all. Let's see. How's that sound? Uh, almost. Keep that eighth note cadence going. Eighth note cadence, not sixteenth. Yeah, come on. Click the right button, Ferrari man. Try that. Just throw that little surprise in. Yeah, you see, it doesn't quite reach up there. <laughs> and I like that. And then, of course, you, you get the effect when the violins come in. Um, the the entire thing, here's what that sounds like. You'll have to listen a little bit more closely for the, uh, the flutes and oboes, but let's listen. <laughs> There's your answer. The violins come in. Right. And that's where this ends. But there's a catch. We need a repeat. So, what do we have here? This is measure 22, 23, 24, 25, 6, 7, 8, 29. So from 29 to 32, uh, that's 1, 2, 3, 4 measures. Guess what? Another 4 bar phrase. I like it. What we need to do is copy that. 
copy all of that because we're going to repeat a lot of this literally, not all of it most likely, and then we're going to add measures at the end of the score. We're going to add four. Yep. And then it's a click and drag, and it's a control V, and there we go. And there's our repeat. Okay. Uh, okay, good. We undid it there for a moment. All right, so in context, the ending now sounds like this. <laughs> gets us to where we need to be. But there's a problem with this. The first time that we play uh, with this motive, it's fine because we've queued it up. You'll notice that the first violins, they go into this cadence of 16th notes. The reason why they do this is to prepare your ear for what's coming. It has nothing to do with supporting the melody per se. It has nothing to do with maintaining our tonality or playing with dominance and, and tonics and things like that. The only reason that the violins do this is because I'm trying to prepare you for what happens in the next measure. So, rising, 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 rising. There we go. So you're prepared for that. But are you as prepared the second time? This will play out. Long hold, and then we just back up to the top. Do you not get a slight sense of being hit in the back of the head when that happens? I do. So what we've got to do is once again look through the architecture of this piece. And when was the last time we brought that theme in? Aha, right in here. And look at what happens. You see this one beat cadence of 16th notes, and it creates um, the effect like this. We've prepared ourselves to enter in with that that downbeat. So if you hear, it's very pleasing to the ear. Your brain, when it hears this, and if I just stop there, you feel like it's incomplete. You you want to hear that resolution. You want to hear that. Okay. And composers also use this all the time. Me, it's just a convenient way to, to bring you into where I want you to, to be. It's, it's, I'm manipulating you, basically. Uh, here, I need something like that again. And I'm going to do it with the second violins. And I'm also going to do it with um, a little bit of trickery, with the rhythm.
that work? Because uh... now your ear wants to complete it. contours all the time. Let's see. I like it. I, I, I do. Let's see. Nope, don't do that. Let's see. Orthodox, but maybe it works. Let's see. Okay, that is what needs to happen. The entire ending, again, with all of the voices as they're notated now. not my best, but it'll do. It will do. Uh, now, the violins, first violins, obviously have the melody. The flutes are still going to play, but they're not going to have the melody, so we can give them just some accompaniments. I uh, also want the horns in here. Thinking, you Notice, I'm thinking of all the sections separately. The strings separate from, from the horns, from the, uh, the woodwinds, and the drums. So you've got to do all of that separately, just how it works. Anyway,
little rudimentary. Let's see. I don't hate it. It'll sound different when we scale it up in the other program. So we'll leave it alone as it is for the moment. Probably going to have to change it again. We'll see. And then coming down to the oboes, do we want to... Mm, we could put the oboes with the second violins. That's my instinct on this. So we'll have them play the same notes as the second violins, but not in the same rhythm. that sound like there. Just the flutes and the oboes. Yeah. love it and most decidedly neutral let's see copy these four bars no wrong four bars copy these four bars copy them into these four bars we have the same thing iterated twice I need to hear it in the other program, really is what I need to do. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to do next, because I, I need to hear this more clearly, because the, the, the samples in this program just aren't quite good enough. All right, so we're back in the other program now, and here's what this thing sounds like from the top. <laughs>
not bad. Not bad. The, uh, the flutes and the oboes are having the effect that I wanted. Just a little adjustment that needs to happen here. The timing here around measure 30 and then again in measure 34, because it's, it's a recapitulation of the same thing, the timing is it's taking away from the the melody <laughs> I like the little dissonances in there. Um, they they add a little, again, another little surprise, another little harmonic surprise at the end of this, and, and I like that sound. I, I do, and I don't like dissonance in music. I hate late 19th century and, and 20th century music up through about the 1950s, 1960s, and then that's when music as we know it officially died. But I, I like it. It adds a little bit of a modern flair to this very old and very austere piece, but I don't like the timings. I don't like the quarter notes. Uh, measure 31 and measure 35. Uh, that's where I have issue with this. <laughs> I like it. I do like it, but I want to change the cadences because uh, if you listen to the violins, again, uh, we'll cue it from 27 with the oboes, the 16th, 8th, 16th, 8th, and then 8th's coming down, uh, um, why does the word evade me right now, the, the, uh, chromatically, you see, the 8th's coming down chromatically like that, um, oops, that was a mistake, yeah, don't change anything here, but, uh, yeah, in, in measure 27. <laughs> I like that, and uh, you, you see, when you write music, everything sort of just builds upon itself, and when you get a little motif in there, uh, there I'm playing with intervals and timing there, when you get something like that, you want to reiterate it in other places when you realize it's appropriate. That's what you, you do. Uh, so, I, I again, I like this. <laughs> this and it's actually reminding me quite strongly of uh, an another piece that I've done uh, this is this is my own this is an original composition of mine this is the uh, the opening movement of a, a setting of the uh, of the the Gloria text from the uh, the, the Tridentine Catholic Mass uh, this is set to the text Gloria in Chelsea's Deo um, glory to God in the highest and um, I'm, uh, I don't know. I like, I like liturgical music for the same reasons I like general classical music. Everything is very uh, strict and orderly and it's got to follow a certain format. But I, I use the winds in a similar way here as I'm doing in this arrangement. Have a, just have a listen. <laughs>
right, so a completely unrelated piece. Uh, this is in D major, and obviously we're working in uh, G major right now. But what I'm doing with the winds there is I'm sort of pushing the choir along a little bit. Initially, the uh, the winds are with the um, are with they're with the choir. They're playing the same notes and rhythm. But um, later on, it sort of pushes the it pushes the piece along a little bit, starting to introduce different intervals and things like that. So um, that's what I'm doing here as well. Interestingly enough, learning from Haydn and also learning from myself. What worked in the past still works now. <laughs> It's the, uh, yeah, it's in, just, it's that interval, it's the harmonies in the, it's the harmonies in the winds, that's it. <laughs> no, 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 that, right there. Fourth beat, measure 30. That's, that's what's doing it. That. That you hear the dissonance? That's that's not good dissonance. Thirty-one. Okay, fourth beat of measure thirty and the fourth beat of measure thirty-one. That is, these are the two places that I need to change in order to fix this. And then, of course, again, we need to do it in the uh, fourth beat of where would that be? Thirty-four and then thirty-five. Aha! Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I'm sorry that this video is so long, but I'm going to post it and I'm not going to edit it at all because I want all of you who care to see just how crazy F-Man really is because th this is what he does for fun, okay? Uh, so, yeah, this is what happens when you're too smart for your own good and you're trying to teach yourself a lost art. Yeah, anyway, back to the other program. Okay, so we're back here in writing mode. So here's what we've got to do. We need to change. Rot, uh, about. There. Okay. Cut off the rest of the orchestra. I don't need to hear them. Let's do this. The dissonance here... Let's try that. And then here. that do scale that up, it's going to work. I, I really do. Okay, so that's measure 30, uh, 31 and 32. We made the change just in the oboe line. So let's go. Uh, no, let's not. Let's not. Let's only do it on the two measures because when we come back over here, okay. Let's do a copy pasta. And here I want the dissonance to maintain. 
maintain itself a little longer. You'll hear it resolves. But here I want it to resolve on the last note. So what we're going to do is this, as it was originally in the first time. And you know what I mean. I don't like to repeat things literally, okay? That's how you do that. You change three notes. That's it. And you can have a different iteration of the same material, and it keeps it interesting. That was the other idea that I was going to have. You see how the flutes, they have this little cadenza upward here, right there. That's what we need to do, balance the phrasing. Let's really balance it. We'll get rid of that note. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. I think we found it. I think we found it. Let's see. This needs to be exactly the same, and because this is now counterpoint. And all together. that okay so we solved the uh, woodwind problem now the easy part the drums and the brass so what we can do basically the way drums work in classical music is they are serving to punctuate things they're not keeping time it's not like modern rock or, or pop or hip hop hip hop or anything that you'll hear in a, in a club um, what drums do in classical music is they accent things, mostly the melody, or if you're writing a choral piece, they will accent the choir. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. Drums don't keep time in classical music. That's why you have a conductor and you have to learn how to count to four all by yourself. So what we need is to look at what we did first and then figure out mm, this motif with the, the drum rolls in this section here. First of all, no, lower. There. 
there's that theme. <laughs> It's here. You can see what I mean there. It's an accent. It is not a major piece of it. Identical notes and rhythm in the horns and trumpets. Teeth again coming up. Bum, 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 bum. That's what I want. Yes. <laughs> dominant time. two measures. We're going to tie these whole notes together. These notes don't have to be pretty or melodic. They're just there to hold everything up. everything I needed to do. Nice! Um, hmm. You'll notice that there are a few staves that I haven't notated. I'm not writing for viola, bassoon, or clarinet. Uh, that's I didn't intend to. It's just the template that the program has. Uh, so let's see. So we'll save that progress. Save things early and often when you're writing music. Just if you, <laughs> unless you're doing it on pencil and paper like you really should. Um, save things early and often. Anyway... Uh, what else should I do? And and I should say, the only reason I'm not writing this on pencil and paper is because I need this to be in a MIDI format anyway so I can use it in the video. Uh, so why bother writing it and then having to transcribe it later? You can do it both at once. Um, anyway. 
what more do we need? <laughs> Um, trumpets, or horns, or both. With the bass, with the organ. Horns are interesting because they can play accompaniment as if they were bass instruments, or they could play melodic lines. They, they're very versatile because they've got that really rich, booming sound. Uh, so you can, you can use them in any number of ways. I, I'm using them as accompaniment, as you can see uh, in this section. I'm also using them, uh, as you can see here, to play fanfare, basically. So you can do a lot of things with horns. Uh, you can't quite do the same with trumpets but you're going to see what I'm going to do with the trumpets. There we go. Modulation. I guess I'm content to leave alone because I need the uh, woodwinds to stand out. just leaves a, a minor problem to be solved and it's not really a problem I just need to uh, uh, need to fill in the, these uh, three measures here on the cello <laughs> Thank you. 
here's where we sketch out ideas. What's happening yet? Same notes, same rhythm. The horns and the trumpets, they accent everything. motion there and the trumpets and the and the horns <laughs> drums. Nice. And it leaves us this section. Do we want to accent that with drums as well? might want to. Um, let's see, where could we put them? What's my instinct telling me to put them? We obviously need them at the end, but where else might they want to go? on what just happened there we go good reminder to save yep <laughs> Trill there. I 
I think. Yep. Last two things. Yep. I think that's it. <laughs> Detecting a little bit of dissonance someplace, we gotta find it. And my computer, my uh, program's crashing, yep, it's crashed. That's why you save early and often, we really didn't lose much. We had dominance here. With a trill. This part. Right up here. Yeah. Right. That might be it. We gotta run it up in uh, the other program just to really get a sense of what it sounds like, but I think we have it. Okay, let's play this thing through and see what it sounds like, shall we? Yes, 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 and more yes. That's it. That's exactly what I wanted to do. That is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, the, the last 10 measures again, just queued up from 26. <laughs>
Yep, that is exactly what I wanted. That's it. And now that this piece is complete, the last thing that I need to do is export it into um, probably a WAV file, either MP4 or a WAV file, and then that'll go into the video editor. And this will be in the introduction, as you've already seen, to the Porsche video. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. Different uh, change of pace for me. And uh, also, I just thought, hey, I wanted to write music for it. I wanted to uh, arrange the German national anthem, and uh, uh, we've done it. And uh, I hope that it had the effect that I was hoping for. And uh, all I've got to do now at this point is uh, I've actually got to finish. Um, I've got to shoot the showroom piece for the RSR, and I've got to drive the RSR. And I've got to then uh, get footage for the slow-mo reel in the introduction. And I need 1 minute 47 seconds of slow-mo reel footage uh, to, to set this uh, anthem to. So really, really, really cool. And I, I just uh, thought maybe you would like to get a very behind the scenes all access pass into what really <laughs> makes me tick. And th this is it. So uh, if anybody knows anything about music here, I am very sorry I have insulted your craft. Uh, however, this is what you get uh, for teaching yourself. I have nobody helping me uh, learning how to do any of this. So it's all me, 100% organic out of my own interest. And that's you know, that's how I do it. So hopefully it has the intended effect anyway. Thank you all very much for dealing with me through this quixotic little project here. And uh, you can see that when you're playing with music, even when you're arranging somebody else's piece, which you already know very well, things can get interesting in a hurry. So that's how it works. And hopefully the minute and 47 second introduction, all of this folly was, was worth it. So thank you all very much for watching. Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks and go watch the Porsche video if you haven't already. See you soon.